Um, I'm going to talk about a workshop that we had in January, which was made, um, made to happen through the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, which is an EU, uh, it's supported by an EU uh, concerted action under Horizon 2020. And it's, uh, this workshop was uh, brought about to look at science challenges with regards to operational uh, ways of bringing about the ecosystem approach in the North Atlantic. Um, it was supported heavily by, uh, by North Americans uh, from the US and also from Canada, a uh, very large European contingent, and also it was co-sponsored by FAO. Uh, and David came all the way over from Australia as well. So the objective of the workshop um, was to explore the strengths and weaknesses of recent implementation of ecosystem-based management focusing on the challenges for cross-sectoral approaches. It was very clearly ecosystem-based management, although we still had about a third of the presentations, perhaps half, um, talking about ecosystem-based fisheries management. Very clearly at the center of the workshop was to look at examples, case studies that had occurred, attempts that had happened around the world. And many of the case studies that were brought, uh, brought into the workshop were invited to try and explore the operational challenges that we had. Now, the case studies um, were mostly from the Atlantic. Uh, we had them coming from uh, up in the north, Barents Sea. Uh, we had a few European ones, including the MSFD. OSPAR came to talk to us about their problems with applying the ecosystem approach. We had um, surveys from, is this going to work? No, never mind. Uh, surveys, uh, results coming through from the Canaries. Uh, we had uh, South American, Caribbean, USA and Canada case studies all bringing their work together. There was also the case study from Australia, 13,000 kilometers away. So not only were there the case studies, there was also an online survey which is currently being worked up and I think Jason has more on that. Um, and we also worked in subgroups. There were 54 participants now, it's something that, in fact, Beth Fulton, in, in, a, in an email to me, and also in some of her papers, has said, there's no forum or metrics to quantitatively compare examples at the moment. And that was very, very clear. So what you're about to see, and I, I gave a very similar talk in Korea. Someone said to me, how could we make these decisions? How could we um, evaluate these case studies? And I said our metric was whether people were happy or not. And that was about it. So, what we did at the beginning of the workshop was everybody has, keeps saying nobody really knows what ecosystem-based approach really is and uh, what's going on. So we said, why do we use the ecosystem approach? And of course, there's the political need. Um, Jake touched on it hugely, and I'd love to talk to Jake further about the recent round of MSFD review. Um, but international and national commitments but I've often been looking for the silver bullet. Why, what's the real benefit? How do we persuade managers that the ecosystem approach is worth investing in? And the workshop agreed fairly clearly that it was this ability to make trade-offs explicit. Um, it provides ownership to a process. Um, and it provides a spectrum of approaches able to adapt to complex challenges. The other thing that came up very early in the workshop was that almost everybody shared the same concepts in terms of what is the ecosystem approach. Now, I know this is stolen, and it was brought to the, uh, to the workshop by David there, and it's stolen from CSIRO, I believe, but the workshop liked this phrase, balancing human activities and environmental stewardship in a multiple-use context. And here we have uh, a balance, and it's a seesaw. And on one side, we've got the seesaw between across society, and society is balancing. Not only is society requiring things from the ocean, fishing, oil, wind, aggregates, tourism, conservation, cultural meaning, um, but they're also needing to balance themselves. The people need to be kept happy. Then on the other side, you've got the ecosystem, which is also bouncing around, needing to balance. There isn't an equilibrium, but it keeps flipping into certain states. And here we've got habitat, 
we've got the effect of productivity changes denoted by the sun here, and we've got the ecosystem dynamics themselves, predator-prey interactions and stuff like that. Now, they're all linked and they're all incredibly variable and we're all trying to balance them and it's about management for maintaining this balance. But, crucially, it's not about understanding the whole system. It's about focusing on the priorities and the important things within those balances. I got told off last week by Doug Butterworth, and it was quite scary, for not highlighting that these priorities are the real issue. The other thing at the workshop that came through is there's a shared common understanding. What we're, in terms of the processes behind ecosystem-based approach, it's evidence-based, trans or multidisciplinary, it has to be participatory, it involves adaptive management, there must be the setting of boundaries and limits, and there has to be an evaluation stage in that ecosystem approach. So, I've put up Tom Hanks there, and you'll realize why when I go through this list. Um, he's apparently the most trusted person in America, so there we go. What were the properties of success in all the case studies we looked at? What, what could you say went well? What was good? Processes that were transparent and trusted with the trusted evidence base and where the scientists and the knowledge providers were seen as honest brokers were considered successful. Processes which had mechanisms for setting of priorities were also considered successful and as were situations where the players understood their role in the process and I think that's quite an important issue and I'm going to come back to that. Processes that had realistic ambitions, a governance framework that honours outcomes, and I'm going to touch on that again later, the right people at the right tables with equity, and limits to understanding acknowledge. This was very important. And recognise externally existing sectorial objectives. Not very easy to see these when you wear multifocals. Recognize existing sectoral objectives and incentives. There you go. So these were the core kind of uh, elements to what was considered successful across all those case studies. Oh, and participatory tool development. I missed that one. So what about the case studies which felt short of expectations? I don't want to put failures. I don't want to put the bad examples. But um, here we go. We've got... Uh, the ones that fell short of expectations had problems with trust. Uh, they had problems in understanding the motivations and incentives for st and stakeholder buy-in. They had no shared articulated need. Um, there were issues with the governance not honoring outcomes. And there were differing expectations and time frames. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Now, these are from the case studies. The first one is uh, coming from the Barents Sea, and this is about the role of political leadership. Now, what I'm giving you is people's interpretations that they provided to the workshop. If I'm wrong, tell me in the coffee break, and I'll quite happily change our conclusions, but uh, this is what the workshop decided. Um, the Barents Sea Norway was a central government-led process. They said, go away, do this, we want it, we want to integrate, we want a management plan for all sectors in these areas, excluding fishing, though, I believe. I'm looking at Eric. Some, all right. And that's viewed as success. Barents Sea, Norwegian Sea, and Norwegian part of the North Sea have quite strong um, and well-regarded management plans now, which are considered to be a movement towards ecosystem-based management. However, the Canadian LOMAs, we have a process which was set up, a huge amount of effort and resources put in, and then we had a change of government. And the government didn't like the results, and the LOMAs were shelved. Tell me if that's wrong in the coffee break. Another thing that came out was this idea that complexity causes problems. And we were very lucky. One of our case studies was from the Caribbean. And if I hear anybody from the Mediterranean say that they are special or different because it's all complicated, I think they need to look at the Caribbean. Now, even they managed to get together with stakeholders and governments 
and come up with a process for moving forward in terms of EBM. Short of expectation, uh, we have uh, another issue, a set of issues that came up which relate to framework and methods. Uh, quite a lot of the um, examples said that there was no clear cl framework for implementation once they'd gone through some sort of scoping and knowledge-based approach. Um, some of the examples that were provided um, showed that science didn't really understand its role in, a, in an applied process, that there were few transferable metrics and shared currency for trade-offs, and policy was ahead of science. Now, I'm showing one of Jake's figures. Um, I'm quite surprised how many people don't really know this figure because it's quite wonderful, particularly in the European context, because what it shows is the policy jump in a stepwise manner and the incremental increase in scientific or knowledge base. And quite often we have a situation where there'll be a jump. And two examples are given. Uh, where this was seen as certainly challenging. One was the Australia Oceans Policy, um, who he brought this to the table saying the science probably wasn't ready for this at the time. And then we had OzPower and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and K Emily Cochran and myself tried to go through this example and show that suddenly scientists were expected to deliver things that we didn't know or understand or couldn't conceive in any which way. And we're still struggling with that. But having said that, there were other case studies brought to the table where they were still waiting for a policy jump. And I know my American co-authors were particularly keen to point out that in the USA, it was perhaps still the science was ahead of the policy in this situation. Five minutes, good. Another one is an example of buy-in and incentives. Uh, we had uh, three examples here that I want to show you. The first one is the Celtic Seas Partnership, um, who've worked with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive of the EU to engage with uh, 22 different sectors uh, for the Celtic Sea. And it's a wonderful example of a, a participatory um, exploration of people's interests um, with regards to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and expectations. Another one that came from Massachusetts was uh, the whole exercise that went on looking at the shipping lanes off Massachusetts and how it related to Wales. And once the evidence base was made available and the discussions were ongoing, the fishing industry by itself decided the right thing to do was to move the fishing lane. And that added 20 minutes to every single journey, but they did it without any further legislation. And then we had an example of things going hideously wrong in the Galapagos um, when the incentives were not understood in an ecosystem-based fisheries management. And in fact, the measures that were brought in perhaps made it worse. So, bringing all the case studies together, um, I've put here options for progress. Could be the next steps moving forward. What the workshop decided was that uh, you need to develop frameworks for implementation. You need to acknowledge the power of and ownership between sectors. Trade-offs need to be explicit, and I think Jake's comments on trade-offs, I think, were very useful there. Use whatever government mandate exists. This is often the problem. Certainly, um, a lot of the scientific groups in ICES say, yeah, but we don't have any mandate. And I said, well, you've got certain things in terms of the MSFD. Um, move forward, try that. Use whatever mandate exists. Find an honest champion. A lot of the success stories are based around champions coming in and pushing and working to create the move forward. Um, and use momentum, but temper expectations, particularly in terms of timelines and understanding that different sectors operate with different timelines. The three take-home issues that were really um, for the center of the workshop was that governance is still problematic, particularly for the knowledge providers. They don't understand they're operating in a new area. Um, trying to work with sectors and across with other stakeholders, with everybody else having a different currency and different understanding of objectives, and the knowledge. Not just do we have enough knowledge, but it's the legitimacy of the knowledge and the translation of that knowledge and the methods used to bring that forward. 
Well, I'd also like to say that there's a paper by Sada et al. linked to the Lawrence Mee group um, who have proposed an uh, ecosystem-based management system, which I think encompasses quite a lot of this as well, and they've done that independently. So, options for progress. This is my personal note from a scientist's perspective. As they leave the science closet, knowledge brokers need to be aware and empathetic to the arena they are entering. And I spend a lot of my time at ICES trying to point this out. It's not about publishing papers. It's about providing tools and realizing that you're actually in a very different environment. Of course you can publish papers as well. So, four conclusions. Broad agreement of concepts and best practices across the whole workshop. Successes included mechanisms for setting objectives and priorities, getting buy-in while understanding respective roles and responsibilities, realistic ambitions and tangible knowledge base. So those, most of the case studies had these core elements. The failures had misunderstanding of incentives, poor stakeholder buy-in and institutional and government issues. Whilst we know that knowledge base is important, not having knowledge wasn't necessarily seen as a major issue in the failures. It would play a core part in the successes. Greater attention to developing appropriate governance frameworks and leadership and roles of actors need to be addressed in the process. So, again, thank you to the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, which is underpinning the Galway statement between the EU, Canada, and the USA for allowing this workshop, and we hope that these underlying issues can go forward.